Hello and welcome. Let's begin with ex-Malaysian Prime Minister charged with sedition over monarchy. United Nations chief cautions of unimaginable climate catastrophe. Prosecutors pro captain of yacht that sank near Sicily. UAE responds to France detaining Telegram CEO Drurov and Japan says China is facing caution, a serious violation. Stay with me for those and more stories. Muhyiddin Yassin, former Malaysian Prime Minister who presently leads the major opposition coalition, has been charged with sedition for allegedly insulting the country's former king. On Tuesday morning, Muhyiddin appeared in court in the northeastern town of Guam, Suang, where he pleaded not guilty. The charges linked to comments he made on August 14th while campaigning in a state election for his conservative Perikatan National Alliance. If found guilty, he could face as long as three years in prison. According to reports from Malaysian, from Malaysia, Muhyiddin questioned why then King Sultan Abdullah Sultan Ahmed Shah did not invite him to be prime minister following the polls in November 2022. The report said Muhyiddin told the crowd that he was the political leader who had the required backing from lawmakers to form a government. The king asked Anwar Ibrahim to become prime minister following the hard-fought campaign. Malaysia has a unique rotational monarchy where the sultans from each of the nine states in the peninsula take turns to be the country's king for a five-year period. The monarchy plays a hugely ceremonial role but is held in deep respect by the ethnic Malays who make up more than half the population. It has also taken a major, more major role since May 2018 when the ruling Barisa National Coalition lost power for the first time since independence. Sultan Abdullah has not commented on the case, but his son issued a strong rebuke to Muhyiddin, saying his remarks were dangerous and could divide the people and cause them to lose faith in the royal institution. Muhyiddin has denied insulting the royalty, saying that his remarks were factual. Al Sultan Abdullah, who is from the central state of Pahang, was replaced in January by Sultan Ibrahim Sultan Iskandar from the southern state of Johor. Talking climate crisis, Antonio Guterres, United Nations Secretary General, has issued his newest climate SOS calling on countries to save our seas as he cautioned of a crisis of unimaginable scale triggered by greenhouse gases, gases rather, and rising sea levels. On Tuesday, speaking at a gathering of Pacific Island regional leaders in Tonga's capital, Noko'olofa, he warned there was no lifeboat to take us back to safety. Nuku Alofa is hosting over 1,000 international delegates for the Pacific Islands Forum leaders meeting until August 30th. Climate change and its effects on the Pacific's low-lying communities is high on the agenda at the gathering of regional officials who lead some of the world's most imperiled countries. Guterres, who last attended the leaders' meeting in 2019, warned that with around 90% of people living within 5 kilometers 3 miles of the coast, and an average elevation of just 1 to 1 2 meters, 3.2 to 6.5 feet above sea level, the Pacific Islands are uniquely exposed. He is also expected to visit Samoa while he is in the Pacific. Among the Pacific Islands' most ambitious climate change mitigation efforts is the Pacific Resilience Facility, the Pacific-owned and led financial institution which will support local communities to become more resilient to climate change is planned to begin operations in 2025, but is facing a severe shortfall in funding from international donors. Guterres repeated his long-standing appeal to the biggest emitters, the group of 20, that's G20, nations to financially support the world's most climate-vulnerable countries. His comments came as two United Nations agencies published TAC reports warning of deteriorating sea level rises on Monday, a World Meteorological Organization report on rising sea levels in the Pacific and a United Nations Climate Action Team report on surging seas in a wormy world, both through the situation into sharp relief, Terra said. The Climate Action Team report found that sea levels in Nukualofa had risen 21 centimeters, 8.3 inches, between 1990 and 2020, more than twice the global average of 10 centimeters, that's 3.9 inches. On September 25th, the United Nations General Assembly is set to hold a special session to deliberate the existential threat posed by rising sea levels. Moving now to judicial matters, prosecutors in Italy are probing the captain of the super yacht that sank during a storm of 
Sicily last week, killing seven people on possible charges, including manslaughter, his lawyer said. Lawyer Aldo Modiglia said on Monday, James Cutfield, a 51-year-old New Zealander, was being probed for possible manslaughter and shipwreck. Cutfield was one of 15 people on board the 56-meter, 184-feet Baisian, Baisian, which sank on August 19th after it was hit by a predawn storm while at anchor off Porcello, close to Palermo. British tech tycoon Mike Lynch's 18-year-old daughter Hannah and five others were killed. Modiglia, one of two lawyers appointed for the captain's defense, said Cotchfield will be questioned by prosecutors on Tuesday. He was earlier questioned in the aftermath of the incident while all the crew members were questioned on Monday. Under Italian law, being under investigation does not imply guilt and does not mean official charges will follow. Under maritime law, a captain has full responsibility for the ship crew and all on board. On Saturday, the chief prosecutor, Ambrogio Cotesio, confirmed that an investigation had been launched. He said his team will consider each possible element of responsibility, including those of the captain, the crew, individuals in charge of supervision and the yacht's manufacturer, Italian shipyard Perini Navi. Investigators are concentrating on how a boat considered unsinkable by its manufacturer sank while a nearby yacht remained largely unscathed. Prosecutors said the event was extremely rapid and could have been a downburst, a localized powerful wind that descends from a thunderstorm and spreads out rapidly on heating the ground. They have said the investigation will possibly take time and will need the wreck to be salvaged from the sea. The bison is presently lying on its right side at a depth of around 50 meters, 54.68 yards. Still on judicial matters, the United Arab Emirates, UAE, has said it is following closely the case of the Telegram messaging app founder and CEO Pavel Durov, who is an Emirati citizen, following his apprehension and the extension of his initial detention by authorities in France. On Saturday at Paris de Le Bourget Airport in France, the Russian born Duro 39 was detained based on a judicial inquiry opened last month involving 12 alleged criminal violations involving his popular telegram app, the Paris Prosecutor's Office said. Early on Tuesday, the UAE's Ministry of Foreign Affairs said in a statement that it was closely following Duro's case and that it had submitted a request to the French government to provide him with all consular services urgently, caring for citizens, preserving their interests, following up on their affairs and providing them with all aspects of care are a top priority for UAE, the ministry said in a statement. Though born in Russia, Durov spent much of his childhood in Italy and is a citizen of the UAE, France, Russia and the Caribbean island nation of St. Kitts at Navis. French President Emmanuel Macron said on Monday in his first public comment on the arrest said that it was not a political step but part of an independent investigation. Posting on social media, Macron said that France is deeply committed to freedom of expression but freedoms are upheld within a legal framework both on social media and in real life to protect citizens and respect their fundamental human rights. According to reports, France and the UAE maintain a close military tie, with the French operating a naval base in Abu Dhabi and Emirati forces using French-built Leclerc tanks and refill fighter jets. Russian government officials have expressed outrage at Ruff's detention, with some calling it politically motivated and proof of the world's double standard on freedom of speech. Telegram, in a statement, defended its operation, saying, it abides by European Union laws and its content moderation is within industry standards and constantly improving. Durov, the company added, had nothing to hide and travels frequently in Europe. Reports from France said Durov was detained on an arrest warrant alleging his messaging platform has been used for money laundering, drug trafficking and other offences. Away from judicial matters, now Japan has said the violation of its airspace by a Chinese military spy plane was utterly unacceptable and a day after the country scrambled jets and beckoned a Chinese embassy official in Tokyo in protest. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshimasa Yahashi, speaking at a news conference on Tuesday, said the airspace breached the first by 
a military aircraft was not only a serious violation of Japan's sovereignty, but it is also a threat to our security. On Monday, Japan's military said a Chinese Wainai recognizance plane had been detected at 11.29 a.m. local time circling above the Danjo Islands off the southwestern coast of Japan's main southern island of Kuyushi for two minutes and fighter jets had been scrambled to warn the Chinese plane to leave the airspace. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs later said it has subpoenaed acting Chinese Ambassador Xi Yong to lodge a strong protest over the airspace violation and demand China take preventive measures to avoid such incidents. There was no comment from the embassy on the incident. There were no questions in the incursion at Monday's Foreign Affairs Ministry press conference. Hayashi said on Tuesday that Tokyo was continuing to monitor Chinese military activity near Japan and was fully prepared for any airspace violation. According to Japan's military, it scrambled just closely 669 times between April 2023 and March 2024, about 70% of the time against Chinese military aircraft, although that did not include airspace violations. Japanese defense officials are progressively concerned about military cooperation between the Chinese and Russian air forces, as well as China's increasingly assertive activity around Japanese waters and airspace. The two countries are involved in a long-running dispute over the Senkaku Islands, known in China as the Diayu Islands. The uninhabited chain of islands and rocks lies closely 190 nautical miles northwest of Okinawa and have been controlled by Japan since 1895. China is also involved in disputes over sovereignty in the South China Sea, where it has been increasingly assertive and pressing its expansive claim. On more stories on Israel-Gaza conflict, Israeli raids kills five Palestinians in West Bank refugee camp. An Israeli air raid on the Nur Shams refugee camp in the occupied West Bank has killed five Palestinians, including two teenagers. According to reports on Tuesday from Ramallah in the West Bank, the strike happened overnight with Israeli forces reportedly aiming leaders of armed resistance groups in the camp. Israeli attacks in the territory have skyrocketed since its war on Gaza began in October. Following the air raid, Palestinian parties declared a general strike on Tuesday in the Tokarem Governorate to protest against the killings. Hamas condemned the attack and called on Palestinians in the West Bank to intensify their struggle against Israel's occupation. There have been about 50 Israeli airstrikes in the West Bank since the start of the war in Gaza, the majority of them in Tokarem, Jenin and Nablus. There has also been an uptick in violence in the West Bank due to attacks by Israeli settlers. On Tuesday, settlers shot dead one Palestinian man and wounded six others as they attacked Palestinian homes in the village of Wadi Rahal near Bethlehem. Reports citing the Palestinian Ministry of Health identify the man killed as Khalil Salem Kalawi. Since the start of the year, Israeli settlers have carried out 1,334 attacks in the West Bank and killed at least seven Palestinians according to reports. In Africa, Denmark to short embassies in Mali and Burkina Faso. Denmark said it will close its embassies in Mali and Burkina Faso as part of its latest strategy for cooperation with Africa. On Monday, the foreign ministry said that military coups in both countries had limited the scope for action in the Sahel region. Instead, it plans to open new missions in Senegal, Tunisia and Rwanda and add its diplomatic workforce in its embassies in Egypt, Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria and Ghana. Copenhagen said that following the closures in Bamako and Ouagadougou, it will appoint a special representative for the Greek Lakes and Sahel region. Ties between the two African countries and the West have declined since Mali's coup in 2020 and in Burkina Faso in 2022. Both have turned to Russia and its Wagner mercenary group for support since then. Lars Lok Rosmessen, Danish foreign minister, said his country's reorganization of its African priorities comes as the European Union aims to be the continent's preferred partner. He said that the EU must demonstrate that it offers an attractive alternative to growing Chinese and Russian influence in Africa. Denmark's new strategy will focus heavily on rising trade and development assistance for water initiatives. We take a breather now. When we come back, I'll bring you more stories. Don't go anywhere.
You're welcome back. Stories from Nigeria. We begin with Tinibu Hills GDP growth promises stronger economy. As the country's gross national product GDP posted another growth, President Tinibu has hailed the newest report by the National Bureau of Statistics, NBS, on the state of the economy. The real GDP grew by 3.2% year on year in quarter two, higher than the 2.51% recorded in the same period of 2023, according to MBS. After another report on falling food and headline inflation, this newest report affirms that the economy is on the right trajectory and is indeed on the path to recovery. As the president said in his 4th August national broadcast, our economy is recovering. Sooner than later, Nigerians will begin to feel, see and enjoy the impact of his administration's economy re-engineering efforts. We want to repeat that this government will continue to work tirelessly to rekindle Nigerians' hope and confidence. President Tinubu is working to build a solid and resilient economy. President Tinubu urged Nigerians to retain their faith in the government and not allow themselves to be swayed by Naysayer's intent in aborting and undermining the current reforms for their selfish ends. According to the NBS reports, the growth rate in quarter two is higher than the 2.51% recorded in quarter two 2023 and higher than 2.98% growth in quarter one 2024. The GDP's performance in the second quarter of 2024 was driven by the service sector which recorded a growth of 3.79% and contributed 58.76% to the aggregate output. Now, federal government to shore stations as petrol hits 1,000 naira per litre. Several fueling stations operated by independent oil marketers have now fixed the pump prices of premium motor spirit, popularly called petrol, at between 900 naira and 1,000 naira per litre. Owners of the station seem not to care about the cost of the product at retail outlets operated by the Nigerian National Petroleum Company. Petrol prices at NP NNPC stations range from 568 naira to 617 naira per litre. These often lead to queues at the stations. The federal government has also promised to shut down filling stations that will be caught dispensing PMS at exorbitant rates as Nigerians raise concerns about the high cost of the commodity by independent petrol dealers. He declared this through the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority aiming that it was not in the interest of Nigerians for marketers to profiteer in the sales of the PMS. Independent oil marketers claim that they've been buying petrol from private depot owners for as high as 850 naira per litre since last week and that this was why the pump prices were high. However, George N. A. Ita, the spokesperson of the NMDPRA, argued that the petrol price reports that the regulator gets from its officials at the depot were different. When told that filling stations operated by independent marketers in Lagos and many other states dispensed their products for as high as 900 naira and 1,000 naira per litre, the NMDPRA officials said such outlets will be brought to book if apprehended. The NMDPRA official further noted that there was no way the agency could reconcile the high cost of petrol sold by independent marketers. And finally on the news on education, on the 18th barred from Wayek NICO exam says federal government. The federal government has stated that underage candidates will no longer be permitted to seat for secondary school leaving examinations administered by the West African Examinations Council, WAEC, and the National Examinations Council, NECO. Professor Tahir Mamam, the Minister of Education, revealed this on Sunday night, according to a report. He emphasized that both the West African Examinations Council, WAEC, and the National Examinations Council, NECO, must now enforce an 18-year age limit for candidates taking the WASI and SSC exams, respectively. The minister also clarified that this is not a new policy but a reinforcement of existing regulations. He also stated that the age limit for candidates taking the Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination UCME administered by the Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board JAMB remains set at 18 years. A recap of major stories says ex Malaysian Prime Minister charged with sedition over monarchy. United Nations chief cautions of unimaginable climate catastrophe. Prosecutors probe captain of yacht that sank near Sicily 
UAE responds to France detaining Telegram CEO Duroff and Japan says China airspace in caution, a serious violation. And thanks for watching. I'm Lois Direct.